collection. And I believe it benefits Child Evangelism Fellowship today. A wonderful program, uh, if you've ever heard of the Wordless Bible, that's where that originated. So, kids, you got the buckets ready? Okay, let's fill them. Welcome to Prospect Street United Methodist Church. Uh, we gather in the name of Christ today to worship him. I would invite you to find that little red pad at the end of the pews and make uh, your presence known by signing in. Do we have any first-time visitors among us? If we do, we have, um, I think I'm seeing somebody point, but I didn't see anybody hold their hand up. If you do, um, just uh, let the usher know. Uh, we have a little information brochure, a gift to give you, and uh, you get to learn about us. Okay. And now, to prepare our hearts and minds and souls to worship God, and remember our call to the body of Christ, let us say our mission statement together. We are united to love God, to grow in our commitment to Christ, to serve others, and welcome all people. Now let us remain in an attitude of prayer as we uh, worship and listen to the prelude. Quiet your hearts.
Will you please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Let us pray the opening prayer together. O oh Lord, open my eyes that I may see the needs of others. Open my ears that I may hear their cries. Open my heart so that they need not be without succor. Let me not be afraid to defend the weak because of the anger of the strong, nor afraid to defend the poor because of the anger of the rich. Show me where love and hope and faith are needed and use me to bring them to those places. And so open my eyes and my ears that I may this coming day be able to do some work of peace for thee. Amen.
As the choir's coming down, just a reminder that this Thursday is Trunk or Treat. Can you believe it's that time already? So come on out. Um, and if you don't want to decorate a car or you don't want to be out in the rain, I guess it's supposed to rain, why don't you consider coming with candy and sitting with people in the lobby? We did that last year and it was so much fun. We were all in the lobby and admiring the kids' costumes. So come and support us as we uh, give out candy to the kids on Thursday. And now as the ushers come, it is a time for us to give back to God just a portion of what he has given to us as we take up our morning offering. Let us pray. Oh Lord, pour out your blessings upon this offering, these tithes, Lord. Multiply them and let them be used to reach the four corners of the earth for your saving grace. In your name we pray, amen.
Nice idea, but good deal. So, have ever you, do any of you feel that sometimes you have not been treated fairly? No, no, yes, yeah, um, I, no, I bet some of you have. It's not fair. When I was growing up, <coughs> um, I had certain chores that I had to do at home, right, and things my, expect, my parents expected me to do. I had a curfew. I had to be home by a certain time. And then eight and a half years later, along comes my little sister. And as she got older and began to do things that I used to do, she got away with more. She got to stay out later. She didn't have to do half the chores that I had done. That wasn't fair, was it? No, it didn't seem fair to me. But it was fair to my parents. So who was right? Me or my parents? Who do you think? My, you, my parents, you said, you said me? Well, of course I'm right. Yes, <laughs> of course. You know, sometimes in life, things don't seem fair to us at all. But it's the way life is. Things aren't always fair. And they get the credit when you did the work. That's just terrible, isn't it? Yep, I know. It's not fair. Well, that's kind of how, um, what the story that we're going to talk about down here is. God is always fair. Even when we don't see it, God is always fair. After all, God forgives us of our sins when we don't deserve it, right? And says, we, and says we're going to get into heaven. Okay, so remember that the next time you think your feet treated unfairly. Okay, let's put our hands together and we'll pray. Oh Lord, thank you for these children and thank you for the gift you give us of forgiveness even when we don't deserve it, of letting us into heaven even when we haven't earned it. Help us to treat people that fairly also. In your name we pray, and everyone says, Amen. You may go upstairs. Do that up. Do your shoe up. Why not? Good job, I know. A reminder that next Saturday, if you don't put your clocks back, you're going to be early for church. So remember that next Saturday is when we put our clocks back. Please remember the Mosher family. Um, Doris um, is uh, kind of 
almost at a loss, and many of you know how that feels. Um, she said, I just turn and start talking to Merwin, and Merwin isn't there. So um, I told her I was going to give her two weeks, and if she wasn't back in church, I was sending somebody after her, so she better be ready. I said, uh, people, we have people here, widows and widowers, who know what it's like to lose um, a loved one after many, many years. So I know that you will come around her and um, support her when she comes back. Also, um, Mary Fox's memorial, um, just will be just a small occasion. Um, we'll be here this afternoon at 3 o'clock for anybody who wants to come and remember her. Virginia Cheney has asked prayers for her son, William. Um, he is seriously ill in a hospital in Berlin, Germany. So he is a long way away, and she's really concerned about him. Limbea asks prayers for the Rob Coma family. His wife, Jenny, suddenly passed away. And Ruth Ann Snyder asks prayers for her sister-in-law, Elaine Schaefer. Uh, she will be starting stem cell transplant surgery this week in Chicago. So we want to remember her. It's great to see Julie here again. I'm sure you're getting tired of having that arm in a sling and not being able to use it, but it is what it is, right? Um, and uh, we want to remember Renita. Her surgery went really well. She had total shoulder replacement. So um, I know she will be back with us very soon. Um, and her daughter said to remember um, to pray for her um, that she has not as much independence as she has so that so that she will let people in to help her. We want to remember um, surgeries coming up three on November the 13th. I don't know why it's that day, but Chris, Julie's husband, has total knee replacement. Lynn Bayer will have total knee replacement. And my daughter Hannah will have something done to her foot. In the first service, I almost said foot replacement, but that's <laughs> not quite what it is. Um, but I'm, I'm not even sure exactly what the doctor's going to do be doing. But an answer to prayer, she is going to come back with me to do her recovery here in Ohio, so it'll be easier to keep a track of her and what she's doing. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Let us prepare our hearts as we go to the Lord in prayer. O oh Lord, uh, we have lifted up many requests to you. And we know that you hear our prayer. Lord, answer prayers in the best way that you know how, so that your will can be done, not ours. But we ask for healing for those who are hurting, those who cannot be with loved ones who are sick, those who are recovering from surgery, all of our shut-ins. Just touch them, Lord, in a very special way today. And let them be filled with your love and your grace. Lord, we remember all of those who serve in our military all around the world. Keep them safe, Lord, and bring them home. We thank you for their service. And Lord, we lift up their families who have to cope with many days, weeks, months, even without their spouse without a parent. Lord, we pray for those who don't think they need God and they can do life on their own. We pray for all of those who live in countries that are not afforded the freedoms and the everyday things we expect in their lives. So many people live in situations where they're going hungry. Or inflation is so bad that the price of food is out of their range. People who don't have electricity or it's been cut off. Lord, these are things we expect. And so many people are without them. Lord, be with our church. 
Help us to know what you want us to do and to go forward not being ashamed, but being proud of the fact that we are Christians today. Let us be bold in our faith and not afraid to speak out. And now, Lord, we offer up to you the prayer that you taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you please stand for the reading of the scripture taken from Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Now, hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. So, so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who carry out to him, who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is the word of God from long ago for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, disturb our souls today. Mess with our hearts and our minds. As we delve into this scripture, help us to be more aware of who is around us and what is going on around us. Give us a word today to give us strength for this week. In your name we pray. Amen. I used to think I liked this story. On Monday, <clears throat> I suddenly realized I had planned ahead so well. We did Moses, we did Peter, we had some things in between, and I had planned all of that weeks ahead. And suddenly on Monday, Erica says, so do you have the bulletin ready for Sunday? Oh, that's right. I haven't got anything ready. I bought a book recently, and it um, has some of the parables in of Jesus. And as I began to read the book, it began to disturb me. When I'm disturbed, I don't want you to feel left out, so I want to disturb you. And this parable is deeper than it first appears. Have you ever been in court? It's not a place I like to go. I was first in a courtroom when I was in college in England, and I had to go to write a paper. 
I entered, I got my paper ready and my pen, and I had one piece of paper. I was only going to write on that one side so that as I wrote, I, I was afraid even to breathe, and I wasn't going to turn the paper over because it might make a noise and the judge might look at me. I was petrified because the judge was one who sits in authority. Later on, I have been in court several times in support of families. I cannot believe that God even gave me the courage to be able to stand with them for justice. In the eyes of the world, they were sinners, but I stood with them anyway. I just prayed I wouldn't have to speak for them out loud in court. And then came the day when I went to court with my youngest daughter. She was about to lose her driver's license for 30 days. I told her, be polite. Don't argue. Say, yes, Your Honor, and no, Your Honor, and take whatever punishment is coming. I was afraid she wasn't going to be as afraid as I was to be in the courtroom. I got called for jury duty one time, but I was going to be out of the country, and that was it. Hallelujah, that's how I like it. The very last time I was in court was during my own divorce hearing. I was petrified. I felt sick. I just wanted it to be over. I sat there next to my attorney, and the judge asked me to come and sit on the stand asked me a few questions, and I answered them. I was petrified that I would have to say something in my own defense. I just wanted to crawl into a hole. That's my experience of being in court. What's yours? And yet, in this story, we have a widow, and there are stereotypes attached to this widow who boldly stands up, not once or even twice, but continually for a long time against this judge who is unjust. We're very quick to label people or to put people in classifications or stereotypes, aren't we? This parable turn stereotypes the wrong way around. We tend to think of a widow as being weak, uh, not being able to stand up for herself, or being abused by the system. And we tend to think of judges as always being right and an authority and spreading justice wherever they go. And yet in this story, the judge is unjust, he doesn't even fear God, and he doesn't care anything about anyone else. Certainly doesn't represent God in this parable, does he? And then we have the widow, who is bold and strong, and we really don't know why she's in court, but she says she wants justice. And we don't even know what that is for. I want to know a few more details than the story gives us. The story started with Luke saying, this is a parable about how to pray and never give up. Actually, on the surface it is, but this parable has a lot more to say about other things than prayer. You see, the original parable is just the story itself. That's what Jesus would have told. He would not have said, this is a story about praying persistently. And if you just look at the parable, you would never guess that's what it's supposed to be about. Luke wrote that part. So let's take a look at these characters and then what this story is about. We assumed that the widow, or assume that widow is poor. Maybe she's homeless. 
Maybe she's without food or family because her husband has died. Maybe her husband's family have abandoned her and denied her any support. Yeah, that happened quite a bit in first century Israel. But the scripture doesn't tell us if that happened or not. On the other hand, many first century widows were very independent and strong and bold and wealthy in their own right. When a couple got married in Israel, there was a contract. We don't like to think of wedding contracts, do we? We think that belongs to Hollywood. But in, in um, Israel, and this would have happened with Joseph and Mary when Jesus was born, they would have had a wedding contract. And it stated whatever the husband wanted the wife to have when he died, because women didn't have jobs, they didn't have incomes. This woman would have had a contract. Maybe that's why she's in court, that somebody didn't uphold it. We know Luke believes in strong widows. Do you remember the story he tells when Jesus is presented in the temple of Anna? An 84-year-old, I think it is, and she comes to the temple and she's spent all the time, most of her life there since her husband has been dead, which has been for years, praying and praising God. And she is one of the first ones to announce Jesus as Messiah. And then Luke's te- Luke also tells us of this group of widows who oversaw the church's daily distribution of food to them and to orphans. So men and women were not weak. I think that's the way this particular widow was, but we don't know for sure. I wonder what's behind the story. Women were usually not allowed in court. Men had to handle their cases. The judge had a strict docket every day that he followed, just like today. You can't just walk up to a courtroom and demand to be heard that day, can you? It's weeks down the road, sometimes months before a case comes to be heard. But this woman is constantly appearing. Maybe she showed up at court every day and interrupted the proceedings. Maybe no one had the courage to arrest her. We don't know. Maybe it was never in court that the woman bothered the judge. What if she waited for him to come home at night sitting outside her house and bothered him as he was going in and then waited and bothered him when he came out? What if she met him in the marketplace and bothered him in public there? All of those things are possible. And I thought I loved the widow, but I'm not so sure now. We know the widow didn't bribe the judge. That happened all the time. And don't tell me it doesn't happen today. Maybe that was because she didn't have any money. Or maybe it's because she wanted her day in court. She wanted justice. What is justice? Isn't justice often something the way we see things as right and wrong? Justice that's delivered is often not what we would consider justice. The original language actually says that the widow wanted to be avenged. She wanted to set things straight or be vindicated. That's a lot stronger language than justice today, isn't it? The word used for the kind of justice or vengeance that she wanted is the same word that was used about Egypt's firstborn when they were slaughtered and when Samson sought 
vengeance against the Philistines. Do you remember how wicked that was? It's the same word. This woman wants something big. And on top of all that, she's a nag. She is worse than a mosquito at a picnic. Don't you hate that? Or worse than something I've been dealing with for the last two weeks. A woodpecker has been constantly on the side of the house. I had to call Gary and say, hey, I've got two big holes and some small ones in the side of the house. We filled it and still... That stupid woodpecker. He's a nag. Can you imagine that day in, day out when you're trying to do your job? This widow is quite a character, isn't she? Well, what about the judge? The judge even says to himself, I neither fear God nor care about men. Well, he's a character, isn't he? I wouldn't want him as a friend, would you? He's immediately thinking about his own status, his own importance, his own wealth and career. He's the bad character in the story. We want to hate him. We want something bad to happen to him. We want the woman to win. But have you thought of a different side of this? Maybe the judge doesn't care about others because he refuses to be pushed around by those in authority over him doing their bidding. We see those characters in the Bible. How about Pilate? How about King Herod? If they had really stood for what they wanted, maybe Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross, at least not by their hands. So maybe this judge just keeps himself to himself, not caring about others because he refuses to be bribed and refuses to give in to corruption. I'd like to think that. The word that is used in the original language for him not fearing God is the same word that Luke uses in chapter 20 when he is talking about the wicked tenants who, when the vineyard um, owner sends people to work, they kill them. So he sends his own son and they kill him. This man has no fear or respect. An unlikable character, but he is in authority. Does that tell you of anyone in authority in your own life or in our world today? This is a parable for today, not just first century Israel. So let's look at the story in a bit more detail. The judge flatly refuses the widow's request at first. We don't know how long she has been coming and asking for her, sen- or the, um, yeah, her sentence to be changed, the, the answer to be changed. The widow does not respect his verdict. It's not the verdict she wants. And the judge doesn't care about her or whether she respects him. We have a stalemate here, do we not? Have you ever been in a situation where you've been in a stalemate? And you are determined you know what is right and people need to listen to you. And yet they don't. But, the judge says, because the widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, remember, vengeance, so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. 
let's look at what these words really mean, because in the English, it's kind of placid and comfortable. But let's understand what words he's really saying. This woman keeps bothering me, he says. Keeps, it's a continual verb, never stopping. It's like a dripping tap that annoys you to death. And also, you have to go to the bathroom a hundred times. Keeps, it never stops. And the bothering me means causing me labor, giving me work. It's the same phrase as when Luke describes a friend who at midnight goes to a friend's house and says, hey, a friend's just come over. I don't have any bread to feed him. Won't you get up and get me bread? And remember, his friend doesn't want to do it and eventually says, but because you won't leave me alone, I'll get you the loaf of bread. It's the same bothering me words used. The judge says the woman wears me out. This is a boxing term. It means to beat me up or to strike me in the face. Quite literally, give me a black eye. She's just not speaking to him. She is threatening him. I'm not sure if I want to come up against this widow or not now. That phrase is only used in the New Testament one other time. In 1 Corinthians, when Paul talks about the severe treatment to his body. And then when the judge says, I'm going to grant her justice, he says he means to avenge her, as in giving in, giving her the revenge she seeks. The judge grants the widow's request justice, not because it's right, but because he is tired and feels threatened and wants to get rid of this pestering, nagging woman. So, now what are we going to do with this parable? Is it really about just persistent prayer? Maybe there's more. The more we read and understand about the story, the less we like it. As I was studying this week, I came to the conclusion on Friday that I didn't want to talk about this story at all. Maybe I could, the, the bulletins were printed and I knew it, but maybe I could just say, hey, there's been a change, but then we'd have to change quite a bit. So I wrestled some more. And the more I thought, you know, the characters of the judge and the widow are real people, aren't they? I bet you can put names to them. I know I can. We come across them each and every day in our lives. Those who bother us. Those who don't care. The judge is kind of forced into some sort of relationship with this widow. And the widow is not about to give up until she receives the answer she is looking for, whether it be right or wrong in other people's eyes. So the question becomes, is there really justice in this story? We expect the judge to represent God, but he doesn't because God always acts justly and fairly. He offers compassion and reconciliation and forgiveness. And none of that is even in this parable. So then what is it about? The pain of persistent, unanswered prayer is heavy. I remember when I had a book just for prayers. And I would write down 
everything anybody asked me to pray for or things I came across. It didn't take very long before that list was several pages. And when I got up to a half hour sitting there going through all these requests, I started getting weaker and weaker and weaker to pray. It seemed like nothing was being crossed off as an answered prayer. And people continually asked for those same prayers. Maybe this is God's way to make sure our motives are pure when we ask for prayer and to test the depth of our desire. After all, quick, easy answers do not provide intense longing or desire for seeking deep relationship with God. Could it be that God is actually the widow in this story who continually nags at us until we surrender or answer him? Maybe Jesus wants us to be persistent like the widow, not in our prayer lists, but for those who cannot stand or have no voice, for those who cannot seek justice, or even for us to take the courage to address issues that we don't want to get involved in because we fear not being liked or getting into an argument or the outcome of that discussion. The older I have got, the more I have realized that the world is not black and white like it was when I was a kid. It's complicated, isn't it? People aren't always what they appear, like this judge and the widow. But there is something I do know through this parable. God desperately loves us and will go against all sorts of authority and power to secure our welfare. Sometimes the evils of this world seem unrelenting. And I just want to give up when I've had a bad day. Aren't you glad that God never, never, never gives up and will persist as long as it takes to achieve his just goal? Luke tries to be nice at the end of this parable and say, listen to what the unjust says. God will bring about justice for his chosen ones. And we are his chosen ones. So whew, we don't have to do all that work. It's going to be okay in the end. But then Luke finishes with this question. However, when Jesus comes, will he find faith on the earth? Well, he's talking to us today, not those outside the four walls. He's talking to us. What does it mean to truly have faith and to live for justice in the world? We may have to change some of the way we think. We may have to get our hands dirty, our feet dirty. We may have to listen to people we don't want to listen to and build relationships with those we'd rather not. Will Jesus find faith on earth, here in Marion, when he comes?
comes back. Let's pray. Lord, you disturb us today. But then again, when you were here on the earth, Lord, you disturbed many people. You made people angry at some of the words you heard. It's easy for us to look at the simple, nice stories in the Bible and not to tackle the harder ones like this one. So Lord, nag at us some more. Keep us constantly searching, building relationship with you, and reaching out to those who need to hear about your love. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing our final song together. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, we are your chosen people. Lord, help us to build our relationship with you even more so that we will know what true justice is and have the courage to stand up for it. Lord, you never, ever let us go. Let us have that same feeling for others that you love. Go before us, behind us, beside us. And we ask this prayer in the name of God the Father, through Jesus Christ the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen.